And be sure to hold on till the end of this program. You'll want to hear our special guest of the evening. Yo guys, it's Luke, and this is my Dream Desk Setup 3.0. Now at first I was going to make this sort of an update video considering I posted another desk setup video back in February, but as I kept removing and adding things to the setup, it became quite clear that this would need its own episode. So if you haven't already, I recommend checking out my last desk setup episode first and then this one. Also, this is going to be a long one as there's a lot to cover. So if you need to, pause the video, grab some snacks and get ready. But without any further ado, let's get down to business. So in April, my wife and I moved to a new apartment. I've always wanted an accent wall, and so even before we moved anything in, I got right to work painting this wall this gorgeous blue color called Winter Way from Bear. I specifically chose this color because of the way it handles different lighting environments. In sunlight, it's a much richer and brighter blue, but at night, it looks a lot more like midnight dark blue. As a result, I felt the color complemented the overall environment as the day shifted. Something I hadn't really considered was how tall the wall was compared to my last room. So given all of this new empty space that I needed to fill, I turned to my favorite website for wall art, Displate. Now, I'm in no way affiliated with Displate, although if they do happen across this video and want to work together, hit me up. That said, I absolutely love these frames. The cool thing about Displate is that the artwork is printed on metal and held up by strong magnets that stick to the wall with an adhesive backing, making the installation and lining up incredibly easy. Honestly, for this reason alone, I would choose Display over anything else. These three posters were designed by the same artist, which I'll link below, but I've really felt like they went well with the rest of the setup and complemented the intricate but still simple design of the desk. For a while now, I've wanted to build one of those pegboard charging stations that everyone on YouTube raves about. However, when I got down to it, I found that I just liked using the pegboard as a pegboard. Who would have thought? <laughs> this is the IKEA Scottish wall mountable pegboard. I originally wanted to go with the black version to tie in the setup a bit better, but unfortunately it was out of stock for months and stayed that way. So I finally broke down and grabbed the white variant. This is the 32 by 22 inch version, which almost fits perfectly in the space on the wall. I also picked up some pegboard accessories, which I'll have linked below, that make storage and the overall organization stupidly straightforward. Lastly, I have another small Super Mario display held up by these rope bungee cords, which is really cool too. So I've made quite a few changes, not the least of which is my new monitor setup. This is the new BenQ EX3210U, a massive 32-inch 4K 144Hz IPS panel that packs a serious amount of features. To be honest, I wasn't entirely sure I wanted to go with a 32-inch panel, but after setting it up and using it for the past couple of months, there's no way I'm going back to a 27-inch monitor. Now, this display isn't perfect, but for me, it's got everything I want and then some. It's AMD FreeSync Premium compatible, which means you'll get no screen tearing with a compatible GPU, although I can confirm that it unofficially works with G-Sync as well. The increased resolution at this larger footprint means that text looks sharper and improves the overall experience. BenQ has a smattering of other features such as eye color mode, blue light reduction, e-paper mode, and various HDRI modes that work just as well as before, if not better. Now, in my last video, my biggest gripe with the previous panel, the BenQ EX2780Q, was its HDR capabilities. This time around, BenQ has upgraded the HDR spec and it's now officially HDR600 certified. And as a result, you can get the panel to hit around 600 nits of peak brightness in HDR, although I was actually getting as high as 630 nits. Unfortunately, the more commonly used SDR modes only hit around 250 nits, which is a bit dimmer than my previous panel, which came at around 300 nits. This makes the monitor a slight downgrade in that respect. Then again, with the release of Windows 11, Windows now handles HDR much better, meaning I leave the display in HDR mode most of the time. Let me explain. If you wanted to use an HDR capable monitor in Windows 10, anytime you switched on HDR, the entire display would look washed out and terrible in pretty much any setting except for an HDR game or movie. But in Windows 11, you can manually set how bright you want your SDR content to look like when in HDR mode, which means you can get the local dimming and higher brightness that HDR brings with this panel. As a result, you get a much brighter and higher contrast image across the OS. That said, there are some downsides to doing this. 
Unfortunately, it's pretty challenging to calibrate a display in HDR do the way Windows handles color mapping using something like DisplayCal. So if you want accurate color, you're going to have to use SDR only. Still, I'm happy to report that in SDR, this monitor hits 95% of the P3 color gamut, 100% of the Adobe and sRGB ranges, and about 98% of the NTSC range, meaning it's very reliable for editing photos or videos. So if I am editing, I tend to switch to SDR for that purpose alone, but for everything else, I leave it in HDR. Now, I should note that if you want to leave it in HDR mode, to my eye, the color isn't bad at all. My particular panel leans a little bit green, but other than that, it's excellent for gaming and multimedia consumption, and in my opinion, the trade-off for the extra brightness and contrast is well worth it. Some minor downsides to note, I'm not sure this is an issue with just my panel in particular, but it tends to look slightly magenta when viewing it off axis on an entirely white screen. I'll try to capture this on camera, it's not bad per se, but it can be a tad distracting. Lastly, there's no USB-C support on this display, which at $900 is sort of hard to excuse at this price point. Still, downsides aside, this is a huge upgrade from my last display and it's a welcome addition to the setup. In my last setup, I featured a lot of different wood products from Grovemade. Well, I'm happy to say that for this one, they've sent out some more of their handcrafted products and in my opinion, level up the desk. The most notable change has to be their new walnut wood desk shelf. This version has an aluminum shelf built through the middle of the riser, which definitely adds more space, but to be honest, I think I preferred the older design which only had the metal shelf on the shorter right side. That said, the new fully wood walnut top looks very good and I paired the riser with their desk tray in this silver and dark felt color. I initially set up this riser with my monitor arm that I featured in the last desk setup video, but I found out that the arm pushed the shelf out a bit too far from the wall and the edge of the desk, meaning that the environment felt a little bit cluttered. So to fix this, I ended up mounting the monitor directly to the wall, which freed up the necessary space on the tabletop. From there, I replaced my last desk pad with Grovemade's fully wool desk pad in this charcoal color. I'd initially chosen the larger medium plus variant, but that ended up being too big, so I downsized their medium size, which fits the desk absolutely perfectly. Over here on the left, I've added this black notepad, which coupled with the pen from the last setup, completes the look. Lastly, I asked Grovemade to send over their walnut wood iPad stand and this really nice planter, which I used for planting a small lucky bamboo plant from Ikea. They also sent over these light gray coasters, which I like a lot. Again, I can't speak of Grovemade highly enough. They make very high quality products, and yes, while they are expensive, in my opinion, are well worth it. Moving on over to peripherals, I swapped out the Lime 80 board from Iquinix for this much better sounding and feeling mechanical keyboard from Akko. This is the Akko 75B Plus, and there's a lot to like here. I had Akko send out two variants, the white and the black versions, with different switches so that I could test out the two. The black one shipped with their jelly black linear switches, and I think I can officially say that I've moved over to linear gang now. <laughs> These are incredibly smooth out of the gate, and yes, they probably could use some lube, but for a stock switch, they sound great. The same goes for the purple jelly tactile switches in the white colorway. This keyboard also features a polycarbonate top mounted design with silicone dampener below the PCB. It's a 5 pin RGB hot swappable board with north facing LEDs, which does mean you will experience some interference with cherry style keycaps, but to be honest, that's not a big deal for me. The board also features a rotary knob and the keycaps are ASA profile PBT double shot that look and feel very high quality. I do wish the USB-C location was on the left instead of the middle, but the board also features 2.4 GHz connectivity and Bluetooth so you don't necessarily need to use the cable. Honestly, for $109, I'm very impressed with this board. Not only does it look and feel great out of the box, but the sound profile is so much better than a lot of pre-built offerings I've used in the past. The only thing that could probably be improved is the stabilizers as they're a tad bit rattly, but other than that, this is a great budget mechanical keyboard. I'm thinking of entirely modding this board with the Tempest tape mod and replacing or lubing the stabilizers, so if that's a dedicated video you want to see, let me know. But for now, take a listen to both of these boards and their stock configurations.
From there, I paired the keyboard with this black and white coiled cable that I entirely built myself. I'll be honest, I've never done anything like this before and the process wasn't very easy. I've never soldered anything and did pull a pad off the USB-C end, which meant I needed to order another one, but I think the end product turned out very well. Before this, I was using a coiled cable from Matrix Cables, which to be honest, didn't have the best quality control, so I'm very pleased that I was able to make a cable up to my standards. I've got to shout out Voxel Mods, who makes custom coiled cables as the DIY process I followed was his guide. Also, he sold me the materials to make this cable. Again, as always, I'll have links down below if you want to try it yourself. Lastly, I'm considering taking orders on building out custom cables, so if you want to commission one, hit me up on Twitter or via email and we can talk. It's no surprise that my absolute favorite parts of my setups are the lighting. I've partnered with Govi in the past, and this time they sent out two products that I absolutely love. The first is their hexa panels that I've mounted on the right side of the wall. The setup process was incredibly easy, and I like how bright and vivid these panels are. As with any of their products, it features the same Alexa and Google Home integration, as well as control via their app for various lighting scenes and custom DIY animations. On the opposite side of the wall, I've rehung the Gobi Glide that honestly is still my favorite product from Gobi. I think this paired alongside with the IKEA pegboard gives the wall a bit more character. Lastly, Gobi sent over their neon rope LED strip to go behind the monitor. This is an RGBIC LED strip, meaning that you can control the individual LEDs independently of each other. And it's got a nice flexible diffusion layer that sells the neon look. Honestly, I'm probably going to replace this at some point for a normal RGB strip as I think this neon rope is a bit underutilized. The main selling point of this product is that you can shape it into basically anything you want, essentially creating yourself a custom neon sign. So having it on the back of the monitor sort of feels like I'm not using it for its intended purpose. But that's a change for another time. Now in addition to the monitor, BenQ also sent out their newly released screen bar Halo, which is probably one of the most useful upgrades in the setup. It features a wireless puck that allows you to control everything from the brightness to the color temperature to even which parts of the bar you want on. It even features a favorite mode allowing you to dial in a specific look. It's got a light on the back which adds some subtle but nice backlighting to the monitor, and it's a very practical product as it illuminates your workspace quite nicely and in my experience reduces eye fatigue in darker environments. Another big shout out to BenQ for sending this over. Now you may have noticed this very minimal and industrial looking lamp that I placed in the corner of the desk. This is the Tavar Hand, Tavar Hand? I'm not entirely sure how to say it, desk lamp from Ikea. I paired it with their Molnar E26 bulb, but you could swap it out for any standardized bulb. I love the look of this lamp. My only gripe of it is that it only comes in this bamboo wood color, which at first I didn't really think matched the overall walnut wood vibe. Initially I was thinking of staining it, but honestly, I think it adds just a tad bit of color and contrast to the desktop, so for now, I'm keeping it. Lastly, I've gone ahead and streamlined my previous streaming lighting setup from my last video, and this time around, I've gone ahead with an Elgato Keylight Air that I picked up refurbished from Course Air. It's mounted via the cold shoe mount on my camera using this articulating magic arm that I found on Amazon. Below the camera is this desk camera mount stand from a company called Jasumo. It was around $30 on Amazon and feels quite premium for the price. It's fully height adjustable and gets decently tall. The only thing I don't like about it is you can't remove the pre-installed ball head, but for my purpose, the included one works just fine. Moving on over to audio, for the longest time, I have been using the Zoom H2 as my main voiceover desktop microphone, but I wanted to switch to something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, so I reached out to a company by the name of Fduce, Fduce, I'm not entirely sure, and asked them to send out their dynamic microphone. This is the SL40, and at first glance, it looks insanely similar to the famous Shure SM7B. But not only does it look like an SM7B, it sounds like one to a degree. In fact, the audio you're hearing right now is coming directly from this microphone unprocessed. Now, there are a few reasons why I went with this mic over something else. Firstly, I wanted something that looked very nice. Secondly, I wanted more of a dynamic microphone sound, but couldn't justify spending nearly $400 for the SM7B or even $200 for the Shure MV7. And lastly, I wanted something powered by USB-C in my price range. At $79, this microphone hits all of those boxes and then some. Now with some EQ adjustments, you can make this microphone sound far more expensive than it actually is. I've only ever tested it in USB-C mode, but if you wanted, you could also connect it to an audio interface via XLR. I'll link below down to a few videos that do more thorough testing than I did. 
Holding up the mic is the ever popular blue compass boom arm that I picked up used on eBay. I know at first this boom arm got a lot of flack online for not maintaining its position with lighter mics, but that's since been fixed and with this mic there are no problems at all. And finally that brings us to what I'm calling the 2019 PC build. And that's because it uses nearly all parts that came out in 2019. Due to the shortages, I wasn't able to get new components, so everything here apart from the cooler is either used or refurbished. Unfortunately, I built this machine right before crypto winter hit, meaning I probably didn't get the best value for my money, but even still, it's a huge upgrade over the nearly 10 year old PC I was using prior. Inside, I'm running an AMD Ryzen 5 3600 with an Asus ROG X470F motherboard. It's got 16 gigabytes of XPG 300 megahertz CL16 RAM and RTX 2070 Super that I will most likely be upgrading to a 3080 now that prices have normalized. The cooler here is the Corsair Elite H1510 Elite Capellix, and I've coupled it with the Corsair ML120 fans. The other fans in this beautiful Lee and Lee O11 dynamic case are Corsair LL120 fans in both the black and white variants, and I'm also using a Corsair RM700 power supply in white. I originally purchased the 2070 Super from a guy over on Reddit on Hardware Swap, and I'm using some easy DIY extension cables that look quite nice. Now, and I'm speculating here, I think unfortunately the ones that were powering the graphics card weren't quite up to spec and ended up causing it to fail temporarily. So I swapped it out for some cable mod cables that run directly into the power supply. Now what's funny about this is I actually prefer the easy DIY cables that were far cheaper, so I might end up ordering replacements to match the other cables a bit better. But overall, this PC build is absolutely amazing. It easily handles any 4K video editing in DaVinci Resolve and plays most titles in 4K at upwards of 80 FPS, although bigger titles like Halo Infinite do tend to run a little bit lower. Other than that, I couldn't be more grateful for the setup and I'm incredibly happy to have added it to the desk. And that about wraps it up. I'll be honest, this is probably my favorite desk setup to date. I really like how everything from the wall color to the lighting to even the desktop accents really came together. It feels like a cohesive unit. I plan on making more of these desk slash room setup videos, so let me know if there are any other episodes you would like to see. Lastly, if you made it this far, comment the word GameCube down below and follow me on Twitter. Anyways, that's going to wrap it up. I'm Luke, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.